Labs. My name is Rob Mance, and thank you for the invitation to participate in your big weekend 2020. Uh, in a moment here, I am going to share my screen. Uh, and today, we are going to be talking about ways that you can improve your chorus sound without saying a word. So, um, a couple of comments here. Um, first of all, um, this is going to be a, a presentation uh, for MDs, for deputy MDs, for section leaders, uh, for anybody who's giving an instruction in front of the chorus. Um, and also it'll be useful for anybody who aspires to be a leader within the chorus and uh, anybody who what might want some added insight into um, the direction that might be coming from up front. So uh, the first premise that um, I'm going to uh, submit to you is that in, in singing, uh, we learn by doing. So as I like to say, no one has become a good MD, a good coach, a good section leader, a good singer, a good, um, you name it, uh, by reading a book. We improve our skills by doing. So if we increase the doing, we increase the learning. And of course, on the flip side of that, limiting the doing will yield the opposite result. Um, if we increase the doing, uh, guess what? A side benefit of that is your singers will enjoy themselves more. They came to rehearsal to sing, and we must constantly strive to give them the experience that they value. And the pacing and energy of your rehearsals will improve. Too much talking will tend to bog things down and it will really drain any possible momentum from the rehearsal. One of the most important uh, things to, to, to grasp as an MD, as a deputy, as a section leader, is that our singers are going to mirror every single behavior that we exhibit. Now, um, speaking personally, I have an absolutely terrible poker face. Um, if I'm happy about something, uh, my choruses will know it instantly. If I'm not happy, they will know it instantly. This is definitely something that I am aware of and working on personally. And so, as we, are, um, as we are working uh, with our choruses, we must show the character of the music at all times, in our gesture, in our body, and our body language, and on our face, we are always performing. So, so many of the jobs that are going on in our head, we're listening to the music, we're trying to identify what's happening, is there an opportunity for improvement, um, what instruction am I going to give to help create that? None of these things can manifest themselves on our face, or in our body, or in our gesture. We need to be constantly showing the music at all times. Also, it can create a cycle of dependency. So, um, I know I, I became aware, you know, not so long ago that, um, you know, that my choruses would start trying to get good reactions out of my face, rather than being focused on the performance. They were more concerned about what I thought. And then we're no longer honoring the music. So we want to remove any kind of cycle of dependency where they're looking for our reaction up front. Um, we want to be engaged with our singers 100% of the time. And uh, what do I mean by that is I, I, I give myself a rule and I give other uh, MDs a rule, which is you are allowed, as we are conducting, you are allowed to look absolutely anywhere as long as it's the, in the eyes of one of your singers. So we are constantly engaged with our singers. And again, on the flip side of that is so often we go inside of our heads um, we might be conducting and looking at the floor, looking at the ceiling, kind of, uh, you know, trying to figure things out or, or diagnose. And again, that has the exact opposite effect 
it has the effect of undoing our connection with our singers. So we always want to be engaged with our singers. We always want to be um, looking at the eyes of one of our singers at all times. Uh, along the lines of mirroring every behavior we exhibit, always show the energy that you want to see coming from your singers. It's going to be contagious. You know, so the, um, you know, the, the, the example that I like to give about this is the, you know, the director that comes up to me and says, my singers have no energy. I don't know why they never have any energy. Well, the answer is quite simple. They're mirroring exactly what's in front of them, right? Or the director that comes in and wings every rehearsal. They don't prepare for it and then complains that their chorus arrives unprepared. No, nope, they're just mirroring the behavior of their director. So uh, good or bad, your chorus is going to be a mirror of every behavior you exhibit. Um, when leading, always show your best singer's alignment. This is something that I also um, struggle with, even though I teach uh, alignment to singers all the time, is sometimes, again, we want to have this, you know, delicate moment with our chorus and suddenly we're turtled forward and we're showing our singers an alignment that is not very efficient. So they will copy you. And as an interesting game, um, the next time we have live competitions, which I hope is not far from now, but the next time we have live competitions, watch every single chorus and watch their MD. And you will probably start to notice that without even consciously knowing it, each chorus is mimicking how their MD is standing. So that's a fun game to play at contest. Um, and then certainly tension. So either tension in our gesture or in our body or a lack thereof will be mirrored by our singers. So as a, as a, as a director, we don't want to have, you know, we don't want to have floppy gesture. We don't want to have limp gesture, but uh, any extra tension in our gesture is going to manifest itself in our singer's voices and that's going to lead to a lessen, lessening of vocal efficiency. So again, we don't want rigidity in our muscles. We want to show strength. We don't want floppiness. But any extra tension in our gesture is going to show up probably as vocal tension. So we can use nonverbal uh, instructions to influence the tone of our ensemble. Uh, as a preference, I tend to avoid non-specific language. So you're almost never going to hear me say the words bright or dark or forward or back or placement or mass, because at the end of the day, what do those words actually mean? They probably mean something different to each singer. And importantly, if I'm telling a singer, make that brighter, make that darker, it's giving the singer no information with which to accomplish the task. It's, it's asking the singer to accomplish a goal, but without ever giving an explanation of how to do it. So I tend to uh, avoid instructions like that. Um, what do I do a lot of is attempting to influence the tone through gesture. Um, so one, um, one game that you can play, again, I know uh, very few groups are actually doing live rehearsals at the moment, but uh, MDs, section leaders, deputy MDs, when you're back in front of your group, uh, a, a fun game to play is have them sing a, a chord, just a regular tune-up chord or the first chord of your piece, and without saying a word, you can just change the angle of your hand. And so for me, um, if, 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 if you're going to shake somebody's hand, if you're going to hold a racket, that's kind of, or if you're you know, conducting instrumental music and you're holding a baton, that's kind of where home base is for the hand. Um, what you'll notice is without even saying a word is if you start to rotate the angle of your hand, there's gonna be a tonal impact 
on your choruses sound without giving any instruction at all. So in general, so this is kind of home base for me, is if I turn my hand with my palm facing the ground, I'm going to tend to get a darker, maybe more somber tone. If I turn my hand up toward the sky, I'm going to get a, a, a lighter, uh, brighter sound, probably. Uh, so we can do this uh, to really influence the, the, the tone of the group. Um, we can also even do this during a chord. So for example, if we hit a chord and as the chord progresses, if I want it to brighten, I might change the angle of my hand. Same thing if I want to slightly darken the tone, I might change it in that direction. We can influence the tone of the group by choosing to have our fingers together as we conduct. I, I would suggest that this is a good place to live most of the time. But if I want to create a momentary effect of a, a lighter tone, maybe a more airy tone, I'm going to spread my fingers apart. Um, we can shift the conducting plane. So there are going to be some conducting teachers out there that teach that we should always touch the table right when we are conducting, that uh, the ictus and our gesture is always going to come back to the same plane. What I will submit is that that um, is potentially limiting to what we can communicate to our group. So if I can really influence the sound of my group, by changing the plane of the conducting pattern. And as long as it's predictable, there's nothing wrong with that, right? So if I'm changing conducting plane, but it's really hard to tell where it's going to land, that, of course, is no good. However, if I make very predictable changes to the conducting plane, we can influence the tone of the group that way. I remember um, CS uh, a couple of years ago saying a, a, a David Wright ballad and this, the, this underwent like a dramatic shift over eight beats, uh, two bars. And I, I remember that, you know, at the beginning of the, of the first beat, it was really, really, really low. And, and so I was pretty much like, you know, almost playing a cello at my knees. And then over the course of eight beats, it goes from this really kind of dark, somber to this really ethereal light. And so the whole time the conducting plane was coming up to reflect that, my fingers were going from together toward a part to create a lighter, airier feel. Um, and uh, yeah, and the, the, the conducting plane my fingers were, were coming apart, and the angle of my hands were changing, whereas down here, they were more toward the ground. Up here, they were almost facing the sky. So again, all of these variables can influence the total response that we get from our singers. And again, we don't need to use any verbal commands to accomplish that. And importantly, those instructions can happen while the singers are singing. We don't need to interrupt the singing to accomplish this. Uh, and then the, another way to influence vowel, so on some vowel sounds, we, uh, we want rounded lips, so on O and O, for example. And, and sometimes uh, our singers will tend to under-round those vowel sounds. And so uh, on certain vowel sounds, I can uh, model what the, that rounded vowel looks like. And so I can influence the, the sound of the vowel a little bit that way. Um, the rest of the time, probably what my mouth is doing is pretty neutral. Okay, so one of the most common questions that I get, uh, especially because I do um, work on alignment quite a bit with singers, it has a huge impact on the sound that we make. So then the, the follow-up question that I get from choruses that I've worked with is, how do you keep working alignment with your singers? Because it is a long-term project. This is not something that happens overnight. Um, and the answer to that is that after we introduce um, a particular concept in alignment, a lot of the reminders become nonverbal. 
So at any moment, um, I can lock eyes with a singer, with a section, or with the whole chorus to get their attention, and then I can give them some sort of visual cue that lets them know to make some adjustment to their alignment or to the efficient use of the voice. So alignment is critical so that the instrument will operate in its most effective and efficient way. And also so that the skeleton is bearing most of the load of the body, it's holding the body up, and our muscles are doing the least amount of work possible. So we're going to follow the rule that muscle tension anywhere in the body means tension in the voice. So for our freest sound, we want to eliminate as much tension as possible. So tension, we define that as I'm using muscles that are not required for the task. So for example, when some singers sing, they develop this like claw creature with their hand, right? We see really tense claws. Uh, do we need a claw creature to sing? Absolutely not, right? So that's unnecessary tension that's going to go to the voice. Or they're using muscles that are required for the task, but beyond what is necessary for the task. So many of our singers will hold many times the amount of tension in their neck muscles than what is just required to support the head. And again, that's going to be excess tension that's going to go right to the voice. So um, if we are constantly supplying verbal reminders of, OK, loosen up your neck muscles, if I keep saying that by about the like third or fourth time that I say that in an evening, man, <laughs> that instruction has lost all effect. It's going to get stale very quickly. And it's going to make your rehearsals feel repetitive. It's going to kind of sap energy and get things bogged down. So um, speaking of my own courses, we spend about, you know, in a year, if you took an average, we spend about half of our time rehearsing in a circle. Um, now that depends. In, in January, we have nothing coming up. We're learning new music. We might spend the whole night in a circle. Um, if we're talking about the, the week before international, we might warm up in a circle and then spend the rest of the night on the risers. It depends where we are in the rehearsal process. But in general, we might spend about half, um, half of the year singing in a circle and in general this is going to be by voice part and each section is voice ordered so my tenors are going to stand tenor one to four lead one to twelve and so on and these are voice orderings that i've done and those those don't change until the next time we do voice placement um, but in that circle, we are hopefully building the ensemble sound of each section. And so even though my singers don't stand in sections on the risers, hopefully the work that we've done of building the ensemble sound of each section is going to carry on to the risers from there. But in the circle, there are several benefits to that. Um, you know, the singers can hear each other really well. I can hear the singers really well. But also, it makes visual reminders really easy, right? So. I can lock eyes with one person and give them a little cue that says, okay, we, we want to loosen up neck muscles right here. Um, or I can look at a whole section and give that instruction, or I can look at the whole chorus and give that same instruction without saying a word. Um, it also allows me, uh, if I need to, I can even walk up and make, you know, I've, I've, I've got all my singers uh, permission ahead of time for sure, but I can make physical adjustments to their alignment. Um, now that's not something that everybody's going to feel comfortable doing. Uh, it took me a long time to get to that point, um, but it does allow me to access each singer again without stopping the singing. Yeah, and <laughs> exactly the point that I just made. Nonverbal reminders allow you to address issues without stopping the singing. Every single time I am offered the opportunity to address an issue without the music stopping, I am going to take that opportunity. All right, so here are some examples of nonverbal reminders. And they're going to have to do 
um, with different parts of the body, uh, having to do with uh, alignment or official vocal, uh, efficient uh, vocal production. Um, so, so frequently, um, our, we, we want our singers to sing with their feet, body with the part. And for many of our singers, um, they'll stand with their feet, you know, either together or almost completely pressed together. And so in this situation, I can, again, lock eyes with a singer and just put my feet together and then move them apart. And the singer will tend to, to mirror that as a reminder. Also, we have, um, we, we have uh, for a long time, taught our singers to put the weight on the balls of our feet. Of course, that is going to have our singers standing off axis, which means they're using more muscle energy to hold themselves up, which means there's a corresponding loss of freedom in the vocal production. So where do we want our singers? Is we want our singers to have their weight perfectly balanced over the balls of their feet and the heels of their feet. So we want 50% of the weight on the, the, the balls of their feet, 50% of the weight on the heels of their feet, and so we can do that by kind of rocking forward and rocking back, rocking forward and rocking back until you find a place where you're balanced over your arch, just kind of like your feet are melting into the ground. So again, I can lock eyes with a singer and just kind of rock forward and rock back, reminding them that we want to be balanced over our arches as home base. Also, sometimes some of our singers will tend to be rather um, casual during the rehearsals, uh, which isn't going to lead to our best. Uh, vocal production. And so again, we can just um, kind of mirror whatever casual um, stance they've adopted and then come to our more uh, efficient stance. Uh, another, um, another piece of advice that I give my singers is that um, good singing is physical singing. So not only is movement allowed, but movement is encouraged, right? So if we can freely move something, if I come up and swing somebody's arm, we know there's an absence of tension there. If I try to swing their arm and it kind of stays there, it kind of works like a, a robot, we know that there's some tension there. So if we can freely move something, then we know there's an absence of tension. So one piece of advice I give to my singers is that we want to just go through a checklist of every joint in your body, and then as you're singing, Keep every joint in your body subtly in motion at all times, right? It doesn't have to be big motion, but we want an absence of rigidity. We're not holding parts of our body as we sing, right? So there's a fluidity, there's a buoyancy to the body where we're not holding things tight. And so again, I can just mirror that kind of buoyancy, fluidity, that absence of tension in the body, which will hopefully be mirrored um, by my singers. So um, next we go on to the knees. And so a lot of our singers will tend to either lock their knees when they sing, or they might not be totally locked, but they're not totally free either. So there's excess tension there. So one, one thing that we can do is just wiggle our knees um, forward and back like that. Uh, again, if your knees are locked up, you're not going to be able to do that. So by wiggling knees forward and back, that's just... Uh, giving singers a reminder to check, can you wiggle your knees front and back? Uh, and then I can also um, kind of go from my, my kind of default alignment and then intentionally lock my knees while um, engaging with the singer and then releasing them. Um, it's important to know that frequently what happens to the knees, it's not a cause it's a symptom. What is a symptom of is a symptom of the rotation of the pelvis. So if I rotate my pelvis out this way, what's going to happen is my lower abdominal muscles, my back muscles are going to really tighten up, but it's also going to lock up my knees. So if you're seeing singers with you know, either really straight legs or, or, or knees where there's some tension there or really locked up knees, Check out what's going on with the pelvis, right? And we can just, again, engage with a singer and just rotate the pelvis under us to the point where the knees release. And if that's something that we've addressed with a singer before, then just that little boop 
reminder um, during rehearsal is enough to get them to uh, refocus on that issue again without ever stopping the music. So we want to get the highest part of the hip bones. So if you find your hip bones on the side here, you kind of create a crest kind of around where the seam of your shirt is or um, whatever garment you're wearing. Uh, and we want to get the highest part of the hips over the middle of the ankle bone, if you're looking at the ankle from the side. And so again, if somebody's leaning forward or somebody's leaning back, again, I can just point to the highest part of my hips and move them over the middle of the ankle bone from the side. Uh, an important one um, is finding um, a lot of our singers will tend to have excess tension in their abdominal muscles, um, way more than was required to sing, which is putting the air under more pressure um, than what is ideal. So um, we can, uh, so I can intentionally tense my abs and then just let go of them to again uh, model releasing the abs. And then this area here, right below your rib cage. so if you find your sternum and go to the bottom of your sternum, you're going to find a little protrusion there called your xiphoid process. Right below that area, this first area below your rib cage, where there's no bone, where you can poke in, we call that area the epigastrum. And this is an area that we constantly want to, uh, to release. We don't want any excess tension here. So if, if I found that a singer has some tension in this area, and I've addressed it with them before, I can just kind of poke my epigastrum while engaging with them again, just to remind them, okay, we want to let go of that area when we're singing. Uh, many of our singers will tend to hold extra tension in their back muscles, um, especially uh, dancers, uh, weightlifters, athletes in particular. Also, many people that have been told stand up straight uh, in their formative years um, will tend to have a lot of excess tension in the back. So again, I can lock eyes with the singer and just kind of tense up all my back muscles and then just kind of let go of that to again, just give a reminder to let go of back muscles. Intercostal muscles, of course, um, every time that we breathe in for singing, we want our ribs to swing out to the side. And our external intercostal muscles, the muscles that go rib to rib to rib to rib, are going to be responsible for that. So if I am aware of, um, you know, and it's something that I've worked on with the singer before, and we're, we want to find a greater degrees of engagement of those muscles when we're inhaling, or when we're singing and keeping those muscles engaged, well, I can put my hands on my ribs and just model that behavior, just to give them a reminder of, okay, let's focus in what's happening here, either that you know, we're, we're, we're keeping those uh, as part of the breathing in process, or we're keeping them engaged as we're singing. Um, so, moving onward here, ah, the sternum. So, the sternum, uh, we don't want a sunken sternum because uh, obviously that's going to interfere with uh, breathing for sure. Um, and we don't want a military mighty mouse sternum because that was tense. Uh, we want a regal, noble, moderately high sternum. And so, you know, if somebody is really tense, I can go from that to, again, something that's regal, noble, moderately high. If somebody's sunken, I can again model that. One, um, one instruction that I tend to avoid, I used to use this all the time, as many people uh, do, is the idea of pulling our sternum up by a string or pulling our head up by a string. And why is that is because where is our sternum and head supported is not from above. And so I tend to like to speak about how the instrument does work as opposed to how it does not work. And when we tend to do artificial things like that, a lot of our singers will tend to add excess tension. 
So if I tell a singer to pull the string up, you know, their head up by the string, um, a lot of singers will add extra tension to the muscles at the back of the neck. So that's an instruction I tend, to, a nonverbal instruction I tend to avoid. All right, uh, the continuation of our nonverbal reminders for alignment and efficient usage of the instrument. Uh, shoulders. Believe it or not, um, tense shoulder muscles have a huge impact on the sound that our singers make, way more than what one might think. Um, and so uh, we, we definitely want to, to uh, to survey and to, to keep an eye out for, for muscle tension in the shoulders uh, for our singers. So um, I can, especially if I've addressed this before, I can model just rolling my shoulders. So some singers will, will tend to hold tons of tension there. And again, if they're tense, they won't be able to do that uh, action. So I can encourage them to do that action for a couple seconds, hopefully encouraging the release of those muscles. Um, if a, a lot of singers will tend to hold, you know, a centimeter or two of elevation in the shoulders, which again is a lot of tension that's going to go right to the voice. So if that's the case, I can model that shoulder elevation, then just release it. And again, hopefully the singer will, will model what I'm doing uh, back. Uh, and then if somebody is singing with shoulders pulled forward or pulled back, again, I can adopt those uh, kind of postures and then go to something more neutral. Now, um, we want, uh, you know, unless you're somebody who has kind of a, a, a caved in, hunched over uh, alignment in daily life, we don't want to pull the shoulders back when we sing. So if you even pull your shoulders back slightly, what do you start to feel across your chest here? This tension, what do you start to feel between your shoulder blades? This tension. Again, tension is the enemy of the free voice. So, um, so again, I can just kind of model that, of pulling my shoulders all the way forward, pulling my shoulders all the way back, and then just dropping them in the middle with no tension, and that's where they belong. And I can model that lack of tension in the shoulders and the arms and the fingers. Um, and then, of course, uh, the highest part of the shoulders, the part of your shoulders that are closest to the ceiling, we want those over the highest part of the hips. So again, a, a lot of guys in particular will tend to stand with their, the highest part of their shoulders behind the highest part of their hips. So, so again, I can lock eyes with somebody and move that back into place just to model that. So obviously um, one of the, the, the biggest sources of, uh, you, you know, kind of uh, and getting in the way of making our most resonant sound, of making our freest sound, is going to be what's going on with the alignment of the head and neck, and if there are is tension uh, in the muscles of the neck and the back that are holding that up. So, um, one of the biggest issues for resonance is maintaining the shape of our vocal tract. So our throat and our mouth, that's the tubing of our instrument. So if I turtle, what have I done to the tubing of my instrument? I have really collapsed it, I've really crushed it. So turtling, as I like to call it, is one of the uh, big evils that's gonna get in the way of making uh, a, a great sound. So I can, again, mirror turtle and come back to uh, more aligned um, position for my head and neck. Uh, we want to get the holes of the ears over the highest part of the shoulders. So middle of the holes of the ears over the highest part of the shoulders, over the highest part of the hips, over the middle of the ankle. So again, I can point to the middle of the holes of the ears and bring that back up over the shoulders just to, again, encourage my singers to find that. Um, sometimes, for, especially for higher notes, singers will tend to reach, or for lower notes, basses do this quite a bit, is they will tend to tuck their heads. Um, and of course, that's bending the shape of our instrument, uh, and we're not going to achieve a consistent sound if we're bending our instrument out of shape. 
So again, I can mirror that, I can mirror this, and then come back to kind of neutral. Uh, if I'm sensing a lot of tension in neck muscles, as I demonstrated before, I can kind of demonstrate little bobbleheadish motions. Because again, if you can freely move something, then you know it's not tense. And then um, you can give reminders of any physical singers, uh, any physical tools that you've used with singers in the past. So um, one of my kind of go-to things for alignments is if you put one hand uh, to one shoulder and this arm sits on the body, this arm sits on the first arm, this hand makes this shape, and this part right here goes in the notch between the lip and the chin. And in doing so, I, this is a fixed point of reference from which I can judge movement. So I can tell if I'm reaching for a note, I can tell if I'm tucking for a note, I can tell if I'm turtled, I can tell if I'm sticking my jaw out, right? None of these things that we want to be doing. But if I've shown my singers this in the past, I can say, okay, let's find this again to kind of reset our, the alignment of the head and the neck. And of course, it's important for any of these to make sure that the singers are actually executing them well. So very frequently with a, 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 a little helper mechanism like that, the singers will be inclined to bring head to hands rather than hands to head, right? So we want to make sure that they are doing uh, each little helper tool in the most efficient way as well. Um, if uh, larynx is something that you've addressed with a singer before, of course we want a moderately low larynx. So where the larynx drops to when you take a low deep singer's breath, that is the laryngeal height that we want to sing from. If that's something that we've addressed with a singer before, we can just, I, I do this little signal of like, boop, where we're just thinking, okay, let, let's get the larynx to kind of settle down. Uh, jaw tension is another big one. Um, and that will have a big impact on the sound that we make. Uh, so one thing that I do is wiggle my jaw side to side. Again, if some of our jaw muscles are tense, you won't be able to wiggle side to side. So by wiggling side to side, hopefully we're encouraging a release of those muscles. Uh, also, um, these muscles here are very, very powerful muscles that we use to chew, our masseter muscles. And muscles only work in one direction. They're one-way streets, right? So our, our masseter muscles, which you can kind of, if you just put your fingers right here on the sides of your cheeks, right where your molars are, and push your teeth together, you feel those bumps pop out. Um, so a lot of our singers will tend to hold tension in those muscles. We don't want those muscles engaged when we sing. So you can just kind of palpate your masseter muscles, and the singer will do the same, hopefully encouraging a release there. Uh, and then sometimes uh, our, our singers will uh, tend to jut their lower jaw forward as they sing. And again, if I push my lower jaw forward, there's a big impact on the sound of my voice. So again, I can model my jaw coming forward. And again, that'll be a nonverbal reminder to a singer of, okay, watch for any movement of the jaw coming forward. Or if I've done something like this before where I put the palm to the top of my collarbone, um, pinky and thumb on my collarbones, and then pointer finger is on my chin. So again, if my jaw is coming forward, I can feel that. And if I've shown them that before, I can just model this, they'll do that, and uh, hopefully there'll be, uh, you know, movement in a more efficient direction with what the jaw is doing. Uh, for lips, this can be an area of tension, especially because for years in the barbershop world, we taught this idea of mouth shapes with the vowels. And of course, most of our vowels are made inside the mouth, so what do our lips have to do is nothing. They're neutral, right? So if, if you say the word me, what do your lips do? Nothing, right? There's no, there's no mouth shape for the, the, the vowel E. Um, and so some of our singers that have been at this for a while will still have some of those habits uh, ingrained. So um, we have muscles that surround the lips. So some of our singers will, will, will tend to engage those and, and specifically pinch the corners of their lips. So if there's pinch going on there, I can just kind of massage that area to encourage uh, a singer or a group of singers to release that. Um, some of the singers will tend to spread their lips wide 
which again is a source of tension that we don't want. Uh, and again, can just model spread lips and then relaxed lips. Uh, and then um, again, we, we've taught uh, in years past to kind of trumpet your lips forward, which again is a lot of lip tension. So I can just kind of massage and wiggle on my my upper and lower lip side to side to encourage that to release. And then, of course, we've also told our singers, lift your upper lip off the teeth to create a brighter sound. Um, this is nothing more than lip tension. So uh, we certainly don't want to pull our, our lip, you know, over our teeth, but we, we don't want any kind of like lifting or, um, so just, just massaging what the lip is doing um, can help that release. Then um, the tongue is another big potential source of tension. So uh, frequently, so for every vowel in the English language, we want the tip of the tongue right where the teeth meet the gums. So if these are your bottom teeth, here's your teeth, here's your gums, here's where the teeth meet your gums, here's your tongue, we want the tip of the tongue right there. And if I pull the tongue even a millimeter off of where the teeth meet the gums, I start getting I start getting very retracted sounding vowels. So we always want the tip of the tongue to remain forward. So I can, again, lock eyes with the singer, here's teeth, here's tongue, and boop, and that's kind of their indication to keep the tip of the tongue forward that I'm hearing the sound of a retracted tongue. Also, we always want the back of the tongue to remain high. We never want to push down the back of the tongue. If I push down the back of my tongue, then uh, I start to get the doctor tongue depressor kind of tone introduced. So if I'm hearing that somebody's pushing down on the back of their tongue, I can again model with here's teeth, here's tongue, and uh, I'm moving the back of my tongue back up. And then if you poke under here, straight up under your chin, if you poke straight up here, this is the root of your tongue, which should be soft and squishy right now. And if, while poking straight up, you jam the tip of your tongue into the roof of your mouth, you should feel that get hard and push down. At all times when we sing, we want that to remain soft and squishy. So if this is something I've addressed with the singer before, and I'm hearing the sound of a tense tongue, I can just kind of um, poke the root of my tongue, encouraging them to help release that. Or I can wiggle my tongue side to side or stick my tongue out of my mouth, which are some exercises that can help release that tension there. So these are all things that I can model to singers while the music is still going on. Um, the last one here is going to be with the soft palate. Now, in the barbershop world, we talk about the soft palate obsessively. Um, and typically with regard to creating more space. Its real mission in life is to close off the passageway to the nose. So every time we swallow food or drink, if this is the back wall of the throat and here's the soft palate, our soft palate lifts up, closes off that passageway and directs food and drink down toward your esophagus until you're drinking water and I tell a hilarious joke and you start to laugh, you have a soft palate malfunction and part of the contents of your mouth come out of your nose. So we've all probably had that happen before. When we're singing, we always want the soft palate up and closed so that we don't have air coming out of our nose. If the soft palate is down and open, we do have air coming out of our nose. We've made the nose a resonator. Do we want the nose to become a resonator? Absolutely not, right? So by definition, we then have a nasal tone. So we always want to keep the soft palate up and closed and not have air leaking out of our nose. If we're hearing nasality, what's the one and only thing that's going to cause that is a lowered and opened soft palate. So if this is something I've addressed before, I can kind of give that signal to a singer to, oh, we're letting our soft palate become a little too relaxed. Um, but because we've talked about so much and so many of our singers are overachievers, a lot of our singers will have ended up with soft palates that are too high. And what do I mean by that is if you poke the root of the tongue again here, if you raise your soft palate and raise it higher, and raise it higher still, what you're going to find out is eventually over-raising of the soft palate will introduce tongue tension 
you're going to feel the root of the tongue tighten and push down. So we do want a raised, a moderately raised soft palate to the point where we're not letting air out of the nose. If we're not hearing nasality, your soft palate is high enough. Um, we don't want to get to the point where we've raised the soft palate to the point where we're inducing tongue tension. So if that's something that I've addressed with the singer before, I can, again, here's your tongue, here's your soft palate. I can model an over-raised soft palate and just kind of let that release a little bit. Uh, so again, the, you will benefit greatly by coming up with a vast nonverbal language with you and your singers. So these are many of the cues that I've used for my singers. You can use some of these, you can invent your own, um, but having this nonverbal language with your singers will save so much time, make your rehearsals more efficient, and keep you singing a lot more of the rehearsal. So under the miscellaneous category, uh, I put asking for the pitch. So um, I, never, um, I never verbally ask for a pitch. So for the, the, the pitch pipe blower, um, in, in pitch pipe blowers in both of my choruses, we've just established this, this kind of um, relationship where I will just lock eyes with them and they know that while I'm looking at them, that's when I want the pitch to go. And when I look away from them, that's when I want the pitch to stop. So I don't even have to gesture. I don't have to say pitch. I just look at them. They blow the pitch. I look away. They stop blowing the pitch. That's it. Um, and again, any time that you um, avoid a verbal instruction like that, it's again saving time. Those little bits of time add up. Uh, time, of course, is our most limited resource as, uh, as MDs. So, um, then um, use of the keyboard can save a lot of time. So, uh, and before I, uh, before I mention that, um, the, if, if my sense is we haven't lost any tonal center, if we're still in exactly the right key, I won't even ask for a pitch. I will just stop and start because there's no point in blowing the pitch pipe again. Now, if, if you're a group that tends to lose tonal center or you're the rare group that goes sharp, um, you know, you'll probably want to blow the pitch pipe each time, but work toward that goal. Redefine the role of the pitch pipe. Let the pitch pipe be the thing that confirms you're in the key. You are already in the right key, not the thing that moves you back into the key you should have been in. So, uh, but if tonal center doesn't move, there's no point in getting a new pitch, you're already there. So um, use of keyboard. So sometimes instead of asking for a pitch, I will just play a chord. I will play a line. If, for example, um, you know, the, we all have various starting places where we tend to start in the middle of a piece when we're rehearsing. Uh, I think that's true of almost every group. Uh, for me, if there's a particular chord and that chord only shows up once, um, then very frequently I don't even tell the chorus where we're starting. I will literally just play a chord. So I can just go and I know that that two minor seven chord in second inversion, that only happens once uh, at the beginning of the tag of our up tune. And so if I play that and my singers are used to hearing that one chord, they know where to start. I don't need to say, okay, measure or, or, or bar, bar 65. I don't need to say that. I can just hit that chord and we go. So anything that saves time um, by avoiding verbal instructions is going to be very helpful. Very frequently during uh, pieces that are in tempo, I will just keep snapping the tempo, whether we're singing or we're not singing. And I play a little game with myself where I try to give instruction to the chorus in one measure. And so what do I mean by that is if we're holding a chord, so let's pretend we're holding a chord, I'll cut off, and okay, tenor is now singing on do, do. And in one measure, we've given instruction and the singers are back singing again. Now, the instruction I gave was verbal, 
but the snapping says, okay, get ready. You're only going to have one measure, and we're back in again. Um, yeah, and as I said a moment ago, if tonal center hasn't moved, I don't need to ask for a new pitch. Uh, this is a big one, is dealing with affirmation of our singers. So welcome your singers to rehearsal with a smile, with a fist bump, or I guess in today's age, it's an elbow bump. Um, it will impact the success of your rehearsal. I aim to have meaningful interactions with every one of my singers at least once per night, and certainly greeting them and welcoming them to rehearsal and saying, hey, I am so happy you're here, uh, is a big part of that. And a lot of that can be nonverbal. It can be just looking across the hall and be like smiling and saying, yay, I'm happy you're here. Important, important, important. We must acknowledge any behavior that we want repeated. We must acknowledge any behavior that we want repeated. And frequently, that acknowledgement can be nonverbal. And that's going to be for an individual, that can be for a section, that can be for the whole chorus. It can be, you know, something really cool happens and I can lock eyes with a singer and give them a smile. Um, you know, a section does something awesome, I'm going to give them a big hurrah. Um, there are times when in circle, like, a section will do something really awesome, and I just run down the whole row giving them high fives because I want them to know that what just happened was awesome and that we want them to repeat that same behavior. Um, avoid false praise. If you give out praise when you don't mean it, people will figure that out and it will lose any effect. It sounds really silly to say this, but I have never given a high five that I didn't mean, ever. If I'm giving somebody a high five, it's because I really mean it. And they know that. And on the flip side of we must acknowledge any behavior we want repeated, we want to avoid acknowledging any behavior that we don't want repeated. So if I'm having a serious moment with a chorus and somebody tells uh, an ill-timed joke, totally not the right time, um, am I going to do anything to acknowledge it, even visually? Absolutely not. And be specific. And again, some of that specific can be like, um, nonverbal. So, you know, one singer like hits this really high note, the best I've ever heard them do it. I'm going to look at them and be like, that high note, that was awesome. And again, it doesn't have to be verbal. The chorus can still be singing while this is happening, but we're giving specific affirmation, specific feedback. And then as singers are leaving the rehearsal, this is an ideal time to acknowledge something that they did that was successful in that evening um, and and so uh, you know just letting them know that you appreciated them being there tonight and you noticed the good things that they are doing and again none of this is fake behavior um, all of this is a hundred percent authentic sometimes it just takes that reminder for us as MDs of you know, the stuff that we're thinking in our head, like, man, Charlie, that note tonight was amazing, but we never actually let Charlie know that. It's just giving ourselves the reminder that this is important toward building the success of the individual singer, of the section, and of the whole chorus. And to not only occasionally verbalize that, but to give feedback non-verbally. And um, sometimes that can be very, 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 very impactful in a singer's life. So lastly, um, any questions? Uh, my email address is mance.robert at gmail.com and I would be happy to field any questions or nerd out about any of this stuff anytime. Uh, I hope that you uh, found this presentation uh, useful and that you'll start experimenting more uh, with nonverbal instruction and feedback uh, with your own groups. 
And, and certainly we can even bring that into our current uh, Zoom environment. It's, it's crazy that seven or eight months ago, I'd never even heard of Zoom, and now we all seem to live on it. Uh, you know, so if, if something happens in one of our virtual rehearsals that's really cool, I'll private message somebody in the chat feature and say, hey, that was really cool, or that question that you just asked, or that comment you made uh, was so helpful. So um, keep engaging with our singers. I know the, the current atmosphere makes that difficult, uh, which makes these things even more important in today's environment. So uh, with that, I will uh, wish you a, a great rest of your big weekend 2020. Uh, and from myself and from both of my choruses, Vocal Standard and Central Standard here in Kansas City, um, we wish you labs um, a great rest of your weekend. And we certainly look forward to being able to sing together in person, hopefully sooner than later. Bye for now.